Well, to talk about? Uh, every week, it just seems the, the hits keep on rolling. <laughs> I mean, I, just before we even start, you know, this whole thing with this uh, FTX. <laughs> I mean, you called it, uh, what, two years ago, you had a sh uh, two shows yeah. saying this is a scam. <laughs> Not just FTX, but cryptocurrency. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, you know, it's there. Now, what were those shows on? The, 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 it was actually a, a show on two things. One is RMB, digital RMB, yeah. a sovereign, sovereign digital currency yeah. versus what was flying around the mm -hmm. market when uh, Bitcoin was hitting 60,000. <laughs> 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 and I said, uh, basically, I wouldn't touch it with no. a 10 foot pole, because it is something that is gray area. Mm -hmm. It is basically people who wanted to do illegal things. Oh, we, yes. I mean, we, we always talked about that's who's right. interested in anonymous transactions. Let's see, drug dealers, people trying to hide <laughs> <laughs> currencies, anybody involved in any kind of illegal activity. Yeah. They're the ones. Now, is there a small portion of people who are paranoid and say, I don't want people to know what I'm doing? Sure. But that is this much. That's right. The rest <laughs> That's right. was all about trying to hide money. And go a little deeper, aside from those who want to hide their money, the, the segment of society that you described, I don't want the government to know what I'm doing, even though I'm not doing anything illegal. Mm. I think philosophically there's an issue. Um, if you have things which are not managed or controlled, bad things can happen. This is the difference between your individual right of freedom to choose and societal benefit and societal good. Even beyond that, I mean, what, remember when we were talking about the, the issue of, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> Facebook was trying to create their own currency. Yes. I mean, the idea- Libra. Libra, and how it was going to be the currency of the world. And of course, it was going to be controlled by a private entity. That's and right. we talked about countries you know, right now you hear, see the Fed raising rates, mm -hmm. <clears throat> exporting inflation to the rest of the world. They don't seem to care, but it shows you how much countries rely on control of their currency yes. and the rates involved. Yes. So, I mean, it really, it, it was, it's, it's been a non-starter since day one. It was a, this dream of, you know, people who like, but let's, let's just talk a little bit about FTX, all right? <laughs> This was a group of kids yeah. sitting in the Bahamas, all right, mm -hmm. who were given a large amount of money. Sequoia Capital. Okay, one of the Big blue, venture capital fund. One of yeah. the blue chips, yeah. one of the people everyone follows, one of, you know, loaded with ex and, you know, investment bankers yeah. and people of substance. Two billion dollars. Oh. And, yeah. and, and until two days ago, they had glowing reviews about the future <laughs> of FTX. Now, just so people, you know, you know, you and I know this stuff, but let's just break it down really, really simply. This was a group of kids headed by a known con man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, this Thank kid, yeah. and he somehow convinced all these people that there was, you know, there was going to be, you know, money to be made on this kind of exchange. And basically, he was just copying Binance, mm -hmm. all right? And this uh, gentleman, uh, they had some, at first he was very close to them, there was cross investments, mm -hmm. and then this whole thing precipitated, I mean, it started because uh, they were running short. They were giving money away. There's a mm -hmm. billion dollars unaccounted for. Where did it go? No one knows. But they, they used a complete scam. What they would do was issue cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. transfer it to another entity who would then guarantee the issuance of more cryptocurrency. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, if you think about it, okay, I issue a hundred uh, million in cryptocurrency. I then transfer it to a second entity. And that entity says, okay, now you, I will use this hundred uh, million in cryptocurrency to guarantee another hundred million. Mm -hmm. So, that hundred million can be put back into the wash again. <laughs> Recycle. <laughs> Recycled. So you can literally double up on a daily basis based on this scam because it's not real money. It's not real money. And even more than that, 
the value they attribute to the not real money is it was all based on the scam. It's based on washing the scam. it back and forth. Th that's right, <laughs> and a lot of people actually believed it. But why? You know, you and I. You know, I mean, we're old. <laughs> well, it's, it's not that we're old, but I mean, we know a lot of people who yeah. got taken in by this. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's like Bertie Madoff. You know, people didn't want to know about how things actually worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, people assumed that uh, Bernie was front running, which means that because he had a trading house, he knew when people were going to make orders. Mm -hmm. And then because he knows, he can jump ahead of that buy stuff that people are going to buy and then sell it. That actually made more sense than cryptocurrency. <laughs> well, it made more sense, but it's still illegal. It's illegal. And yet sure. people I knew personally mm -hmm. put millions and millions of dollars and they would tell me, say, hey, Einer, uh, <clears throat> listen, Bernie doesn't accept money from just anybody. You have to get in line. Luckily, I know Bernie, so I think I could get you in. And I just laughed. I said, either it's a complete Ponzi scheme. It is a Ponzi scheme. It was. Yeah, yeah. But I said, or he's doing something illegal. Either way, I wouldn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. In terms no of one crypto, could... the, the, the whole philosophy behind crypto is that there are only so many 22 million Bitcoins yeah. in the world. Yeah. Shortage and of supply. <laughs> that's right. It's just like Hermes selling bags. There are only 100 bags. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you're getting something. That's right. I mean, Here you're getting you know, paper. A, a crocodile, a bag, you know, matched skins, only so many put out each year. <laughs> yeah, but the crypto thing is just air. Yeah, it's just <laughs> literally. Air. But I mean, it, it's, it's improbable. There's going to be a movie about this, if not many. Uh, how it's possible that these big um, you know, investment firms were Huge. duped yeah. into putting billions of dollars and writing up this company as if it was a miracle company when it was just clearly a scam. I mean, I, I was a defense attorney. I spent a year mm. in the prosecutor's office as an intern. I mean, come on. This, this wasn't even sophisticated. And this, this young man, I mean, he's wearing a t-shirt. That's right. You know, he has unkempt hair mm. and somehow he convinces these people. Oh, unbelievable. It was all part of the show. Well, you know, he's always part of the show. Yes. <laughs> Reminds me of another guy I see a lot on TV in a T-shirt all the time. <laughs> <laughs> also selling uh, something that's not but real. There were people who were in T-shirts who actually made it really, really, really well. Yeah. Stephen Jobs. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, that was a turtleneck. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Half turtleneck, turtleneck yes. yes. I think that's where it kind of came from when he became yeah. very... Uh, low key and the, the same black turtleneck. Do you know the story behind that? No. It was funny. He, he wanted to have a uniform for all Apple employees. This is a guy who says creativity, individuality, yes. things uh -huh. like that. He wanted to have a uniform. So he uh, got a very well-known um, designer to come up with this uniform. And in the end, he didn't go with it. But then there were there hundreds of these t-shirts I mean, of these, uh, these turtlenecks Turtleneck. left over. So he just took them home and he just started wearing them. Every day, <laughs> Every the day. same outfit. And then yeah. all of a sudden it became his trademark. I and mean, it became fashionable. Well, yes, Valley. I, yeah, yeah. Be, be like uh, Steve Jobs. Although the fact is, Steve Jobs was not a nice person. Mm. Uh, he didn't really have any friends. Um, he right. took credit from Steve Wozniak, who was yeah. actually the brains behind everything. Yeah. But, you know, I always, what I say, there's a certain amount of karma in the world. Mm -hmm. All right. Steve Jobs had a tragic ending. Um, his legacy, I think, is marred by the, you know, his, his personal troubles, mm -hmm. not willing to recognize his daughter until the very end. Um, you know, the way that he treated a lot of people at Apple. Yes, he was a perfectionist, but he didn't care about the human cost. No. And, and this to me illustrates one of the problems that we have today is that everybody thinks of things in just money. They yeah. don't think about, you know, where it's coming from, whether it's using child labor in some, you know, third world country, mm -hmm. global south, to mm -hmm. make uh, garments that sell for thousands of dollars. But they don't want to pay these guys more than 50 cents an hour uh, to do yeah. it. I mean, at some point, don't 
governments have a responsibility to have an understanding. You, you hear a lot of words about this, but then every year there's a scandal involving some company that's sourcing from somebody. And then they weaponize it with Xinjiang. Yeah, I mean, for example. Clearly, yeah, they, and they have no basis for it, but they say, oh, based on a report by somebody who is it's never a, been there, who's never been there, but well, he's, he was, he was there. I mean, I'm talking about Adrian Zenz, uh -huh. um, but based on an extrapolation. Uh, now this is a guy who's employed by a, a front company for the central intelligence agency mm -hmm. of the United States. And yet this is, you know, used, they try to equate all of these things. And this they're is false this, equivalencies. This is, this is something that, I actually quite interesting here because what does modernization mean? Exactly. Is it about people or about a few people getting rich? That's right. Is it about a couple billionaires or is it about the overall value created can create better lives for the, the whole population? And this is what modernization should mean, right? It should be, yeah. but yet, um, you know, people sit down and worship and put money into individuals who are clearly conmen, all right? And then, you know, money is lost. That $2 billion that uh, Sequoia put in, that's going to hit some people pretty hard, and not just the capital partners at Sequoia. Yeah. The people who put money into them. The LPs. The LPs, limited partners. You know? Yeah. So let's, let's move on. Um, COP27. Nothing happened, as we discussed predict before, and discussed. Sure. COP27 has been around for quite some time. Well, 27 means 27, yeah, 27 yeah, meetings. <laughs> meetings. Um, again, it comes down to this. Developed countries are unwilling to pay for the damage to the environment they've done before over as, as evidenced by Boris Johnson, who is, as I recall, not a member of the British government, uh, coming out and expressing the British position that, yeah, we polluted our way to success, but it's not our problem, and we don't have the funds, that's so we right. don't care. That's right. All the commitments developed countries have made over the years at COP, mm. none of them were delivered. Well, there's supposed to be $100 billion put in per uh, year. Per year starting with 2020, yeah. and we haven't seen but a fraction of That's that. Right. That's and, and there's no excuses. I mean, if you agreed to this, isn't the international order based on agreements? Based on commitments. Commitments. Yes, exactly. And then the other part is the beginnings of the planning of imposing a tax, a carbon tax on developing economies. You want to develop the economy? <laughs> they don't have You want anything. to industrialize? <laughs> oh, you want to generate electricity? You have to pay a carbon tax. Yeah, but I mean, this is a wealth transfer. These From the poor to the rich. Exactly. But these are, these are countries that don't have any of this money. How do you expect them to pay That's a tax? Right. They can't even pay back their debts. Uh, in effect, what happens is the more industrialized of the developing countries are supposed to pay a tax on their manufacturing. Now, if you look at it, which country is it? It's China. Mm -hmm. The target is obviously China. China yeah. is more efficient. It's got economies of scale. It's got the infrastructure. So it could produce things more cheaply. Yes. But in the end, all right, who are these goods going consumers. to? Consumers. Who are consumers? The consumers? Where? Europe. America, uh, that's right. All, right, all over the world. And here, here's the thing, all of the developed countries count whatever is created, whatever mm -hmm. carbon footprint is created within their country, mm -hmm. but they take no responsibility for the carbon footprint of the things they use created in other countries. That's right. And now they want to tax that's right. <laughs> those. Now, ultimately, it's a, it'd be putting a tax on themselves. But, I mean, you know, how cynical must you be Actually, that, it's quite simple. Yeah. It's called protectionism because you want to lower the competitiveness of those who are more efficient than you by imposing this tax. And, and that's something that people should be really looking at. Yeah. Uh, is, is this just a cynical ploy uh, by those who have lost their competitiveness? That's right. right. 
uh, Europe and, and America. I'm quite convinced this is a significant part of the, the whole purpose behind. It's a rationalization. Carbon. Yeah. Yeah. It says the, these people stole manufacturing for us. What? Yeah. I mean, you produce it, you know, 15 to $20 vehicle. an hour is your cost of labor. 50 cents is what you're willing to pay in Bangladesh yeah. per hour. I mean, how, how is it that Bangladesh stole your manufacturing? That's right, your job. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't legally produce for 50 cents an hour in the U.S. So how is it that they stole? Even it? using illegal migrant workers, they couldn't, uh, well, they couldn't compete. Well, migrant workers aren't uh, welcome except during harvest time uh, or when you need cheap labor, mm. all right, or when you need to compete. Seems uh, like the case now. They're looking for cheap labor now. Looking for cheap labor, where is, where is it going to come from? They're not, uh, there's a war at the borders. Everyone's saying that mm. anybody who's trying to enter another country is somehow suspect, mm -hmm. when in fact, the very people who are trying to move are the reason they're moving is because of conflicts created in their countries. And where do they trace back to? In the largest number of cases, it goes back to the United States, yeah. Europe, all of these things, whether you're talking about the Middle East, South America, mm -hmm. where, are, where are people coming from? Venezuela, That's right? right. Oh, that's conflict areas, areas where the United States says, we want nothing to do. We're going to try to uh, literally push you into economic submission with all of these tariffs and, right? sanctions. and sanctions. And they're surprised when people want to leave because they can't live mm -hmm. because of the sanctions they put on. But then they say, well, but we don't want you here. All right. We, we want you to go back and fight in your country. All right. Do regime change. Regime change. But I mean, it just doesn't seem like a stable um, platform to run the world. That's right. Where you're trying to literally put yourself first all the time. Isn't leadership about putting others first? Well, you don't even have to put the others first. You have to consider the interests of the others. Even as, as simple, something as simple as that, the U.S. can't do, unfortunately. Well, then it's, it's, it's so incredibly short term. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, from COP27, we got nothing. Uh, and I expect very little to happen until there's an acceptance that we're in this boat together. That's right. And right now, everyone's just saying, no, every man for himself. Everyone's rowing. We're in one boat and everybody's paddle is going in a different direction. In a different direction. direction. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, thanks. All right. We have to mention tough times are being re reflected in mm -hmm. uh, China. Uh, a lot of the numbers were down. Uh, significant parts of the economy up. It looks like the real estate in, uh, industry is looking more positive. You've seen, you know, the new policies, the new yeah. policies pushing it up. There's also yeah. a lot of of uh, euphoria about what we'll talk about later, which is the meeting between Biden mm -hmm. and Xi mm -hmm. at the G on the sidelines of the G20. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know that anything has really changed. And when you start, the uh, the IMF has downgraded. Um, world, economic world economic economic in 2023 yeah, that's right. by uh, two points. And even 2024, they're, they're becoming more pessimistic. Well, yeah, um, but I mean, these things, and right now people say, oh, inflation's over. Uh, in the United States, they had, a, at least for manufacturing, uh, they only had a very modest increase. But food and energy still remains high. You know, I know there are ways in which you can manipulate figures mm. because in fact, from September to October, the real rate of inc increase of inflation, there was a real rate, real increase, I think 0 0.4, 0 0.5%. The reason why they say it's peak is compared to a year ago. Yes, compared to a year ago. <laughs> so in effect, if from September to October, it went up, 0.4% or 0.5%. To me, it hasn't peaked. No. It is no. still going up. It is still, and we're, we're going to see the, uh, the numbers going forward. Yeah. But it, it really um, highlights this issue because right now you hear a lot of criticism about China. China needs to just drop COVID. Yeah. If people die, who cares? Once again, let's put economics above people. Yeah. Um, and then, um, but there's this global slowdown. 
all across the board. Yeah. And that has to be factored in. I, I do still believe that China will get the largest share of a declining market. But even so, that is going to affect uh, manufacturing. And it, it would affect China's import-export numbers yeah. significantly. Um, this is why I think the central government's policy of doing more internal circulation, creation of a domestic market, and the rapid integration of China and ASEAN countries. Yeah, we've really seen that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's very clear. ASEAN is not choosing sides. They're That's just right. choosing, they're choosing to do what is necessary. They're, they're talking about it in, the, in almost the same terms as China, peace and development. Yeah, yes. but, okay, so there's talk and there's reality. Uh -huh. So you, I was uh, looking at the report by the IMF. If you start looking, U.S. 1% growth, 1.2% uh -huh. growth. Uh, Europe, uh, much less than that. It could be it negative, negative this year, yeah. Uh, and no, even going forward into 2023. Mm -hmm. But then you start looking at the rest of the world. China, three, over 3%. Yeah. Okay. ASEAN, over 4%. 4%, yeah. So, you know, you see the world dividing. You have the developed north. Yeah. And then the rest. And the rest are doing better than the developed countries. Yeah. And this inversion, I mean, it used to be the developed countries went along. It didn't really matter. You know, the, the others could suffer. That was okay. Now, all of a sudden... It's the developed world suffering. I think uh, what you said about uh, ASEAN countries are basically say, saying, don't ask us to choose sides. Yeah. This is already something very significant in that it's very different from how it would be four or five years ago, where the U.S. would dominate and push through policies which were U.S.-centric. And now they're basically saying, uh-uh, peace and development. Okay, uh, okay. This is a good jumping point into the big issue for this week. And that was the G20 mm -hmm. and what happened. Unfortunately, I think it got hijacked. This was supposed to be about the problems of the world. But all, all eyes were focused in terms of uh, Ukraine, North Korea, and the big meeting between China yeah. and uh, the United States. But what did you take away from that, uh, from the end of the meeting? Well, I, I think, uh, thank G G20 and thank the host Indonesia, yeah. who organized it very well. And a, and a shout out to our good friend, Joe. Yeah. Ambassador of yes. uh, Indonesia. To He's China. done incredible work. He's done an incredible job. I think what's really significant is that G20 provided an opportunity for bilateral discussions. It's not only the head of, head of states of China and know, but, U.S. But isn't it supposed to be talking about leading the world instead of trying to solve problems between rich countries? But I think um, without addressing some of these issues on a bilateral basis, for example, resolving the heating up of the battle between China and or the attacks of, of the U.S. against China, uh, a lot of these issues would be very difficult to solve. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm not very optimistic on China-U.S. relations going forward uh, because uh, talk is empty. Talk is talk. Uh, we, we, we've heard the talk all along. Yeah. But the fact is the actions have not fit the talk. So Very yeah. simple. Mm -hmm. President Biden says, we're not trying to do a Cold War with China. We're not trying to suppress China's development and rise. The five no's. <laughs> That's right. No, we're not. So would you withdraw the trade war? Would you... Take out the, the sanctions against Chinese companies? That's also no. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Would you stop the technology war? Will you the stop the finance war? Will you stop uh, targeting Chinese companies and That's individuals? Right. But it's not just China. Yeah. The U.S. has problems with all sorts of countries around the oh, world. Oh, against and, the Europeans now, but too. Sanctions keep going. Yeah. I mean, no one withdraws the sanctions. And then when they don't work, they say, we need more sanctions. Mm -hmm. But we're running out of sanctions. And the U.S. Uh, literally were sanctioning everybody and threatening more. That's right. Um, so it just sounds to, sounds to me like, okay, for the U.S. side, this thing about, oh, we're not trying to contain China. We're not trying to launch a Cold that? War against China. Who believes China. that? It's, but all the actions point to the acceleration of suppressing China yeah. can 
unfortunately. Well, I mean, the, the, uh, not only saying that U.S. companies cannot sell chips uh, and cannot uh, have anybody from China involved in them because mm -hmm. uh, they possibly security risks, uh, they're now, you know, extraterritorial jurisdiction. They're saying long that, arm, long arm. He says, if you're a com if you're a company that is not American, that is based in in Holland, mm -hmm. in the Netherlands, you can't sell chip making equipment to China. That's right. So how is this not about containment? That's right. And there was there was nothing um, of substance offered from the U.S. side. Yeah. And, and, and that that's what I was looking for. I mean, yes. It's a baby step in the right direction in terms of assuring people that, you know, we won't go below a certain level, mm -hmm. but it's really not hopeful. So I think, but I wanted to give my takeaway on this, which was you have the meeting and I, I look very closely at what Xi Jinping said and what mm -hmm. Biden said. Xi Jinping was expressing, he says, look, we're, we're the adults. We're the, um, because we're the largest mm -hmm. economic entities in the world economies. We need to be thinking about other people. We need to be cooperating. Mm -hmm. We need to be looking at the global situation. Mm -hmm. From Biden, it was all about what China should do. China should solve Ukraine. China should solve DPRK. Uh, China uh, needs to stop being aggressive on areas uh, of like Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand that because it's the U.S. who is taking ships up and down the Taiwan Straits mm -hmm. twice a month. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the ones who are enhancing relations with Taiwan, arming it, mm -hmm. not with uh, defensive uh, armaments, but offensive armaments, training, uh, covertly training uh, Taiwanese troops on how to resist uh, a Chinese, quote, invasion without any evidence that China intends to invade or do anything That's necessary. Right. I mean, 42% of the country GDP is linked to mainland China. Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. I mean, if China wants to take Taiwan, all they have to do is say we end trade. That's right. It would be a rock in the ocean that can't support itself. Yeah. Not only that, in terms of South China Sea, aggressive behavior by, Ch by China in the South China Sea it's U.S., Australia, Japanese warships who are running around. Well, AUKUS, yeah. all right, the Quad. Yeah. I mean, you have all of these alliances, which, once again, are not targeting China. No. <laughs> I know China hasn't been, off <laughs> been offered but a But yesterday conclusion. there was an announcement, there was an announcement that was interesting uh, by the Vietnamese government on the South China Sea Code of Conduct and actually confirming the heads of state meeting two weeks ago on collaboration in the South China Sea. So here, again, ASEAN is yeah. taking a very firm position. We're not going to be your proxy. We're not going to do your bidding. But why would they? They've yeah. seen what's happened in Africa, South America, right. Middle East, Central Asia. Why would they be anxious to be a proxy and have their economies destroyed? But at our age, we know 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or 20 years ago, it's very difficult. It was very difficult. And even until four or five years ago, it's very difficult for the developing South to say no to big pressure by the Americans. But now they're saying it, even Korea. Yeah, well, okay, so let's go down the list of notes. South America, we're not interested in the, the US agenda in Europe, yeah. okay. Africa. Forget I mean, it. <laughs> they're just saying, no, we're yeah. not interested. India, yeah. kicking back. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, who, who, who was it that said, oh, it's fine. Um, Janet Yellen yeah. saying, it's fine for India to buy as much oil as they like from Russia, Russia, as long as you don't violate any of our rules and sanctions that we've put in place unilaterally. Yeah. I mean, I thought that was a very strange thing. But then Middle East, UAE got warned off. Yeah. I mean, they, they were told... Uh, is, oh, you, you might be a problem. Why? Speaking of the Middle East, yeah. the development of relationship between Middle East and Asia and East Asia is rapid and deepening. A lot of investment moving in from the Middle East into That's right. Asia. That's right. Not just China. Not just China. It's yeah. all over Asia. 
but the China side, of course, is most significant. I was told just yesterday that the meeting between the heads of state of Arab League and Xi and President Xi of China will be the first head of state meeting of the Arab League with China. Yes. Uh, used to be foreign minister level in, in a discussion forum, but now it's reached to the head of state level, which is very, very significant. And then the Gulf Cooperation Council of the six countries, head of state, meeting with President Xi on this visit in December. But it's not just those meetings. Yeah. What was really remarkable about the G20 mm -hmm. is that you had all of these, quote, allies of the U.S. Australia. Like France. Great, France. Brit Great Britain yes. is in those, on the things. I mean, what, what, what do you make of that? I mean, it just seems, uh, and, and she, what, he has uh, eight, nine uh, mm. meetings. Yeah. Biden, I think he had one meeting with Turkey. Yeah. But nothing to report on it. All of the attention. All the allies of the U.S. Quote unquote, lining up. And yeah. Germany came early. That's right. And uh, walked away yeah. with 27 billion. Yeah. Is, do, you, do, you, do you see Europe all of a sudden reassessing and looking at the ASEAN model and saying, look, we don't need to choose sides. Yeah, we wouldn't want uh, China to help uh, in terms of the Ukraine. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. But they, they seem to be all saying, well, we need to meet Xi. We need to make some sort of peace. Um, Improve to, relations. We have to. Well, yeah, exactly. I, I see this as ec pragmatic economics. That's right. Above all the kind of Interest nonsense. of the countries themselves and its yeah. own people. There's I mean, no question. Yeah. They, they always talk about values. <laughs> well, no, no, no they, they are. And, yeah, and that's the narrative. This is, well, we don't share values with China. Well, actually, I, I think they, they do. I mean, Europe is a socialist area. I mean, and there's no doubt. It's, it, yeah, it has... I, I, liberal socialism. Liberal yeah. socialism. Yeah. China is actually more <laughs> capitalist yeah. than, than Europe. Market-driven. So yeah. where, where do the values differ? They, they say, well, it's the ballot box and the freedom of information. I mean, freedom of speech. But what has that garnered Europe? It's drifting more to the right. That's right. It has a, a lot of <clears throat> the same problems that are developed in the US in terms of race and, and politics, single issue areas, the Greens, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Those are now starting to show up in Europe. Extremism, just like in the 1930s. Yeah. Um, but speaking of values, uh, I read a piece by an Indian analyst I don't remember where it was, but what was interesting about that was that uh, it talked about common values promoted by the U.S. between India and the United States. We're the big democracies of the world, right? Mm -hmm. We must unite against autocrats, right? But the Indian view is, oh, we play U.S., China, and, and Russia to the interest of our country. But is it yeah. helping India? As long as we can play it properly, they feel that it would help India, but not go by this autocrat versus democracy yeah. thesis. Well, it's, yeah. it's becoming, it's certainly not playing well in the you rest of the, the world. You used the expression, you used an expression, India is transactional. It is, yeah. but you know, yeah. what, what I, a strong India is in everybody's interest. I mean, yeah. they have massive uh, population, population yeah. a lot of it young. You don't yeah. want to see it destabilized. But you know, playing off geopolitically, it's not Russia, cool. China, yeah. and the U.S. is not creating jobs in India. No, uh, you you haven't seen these big things. I mean, they say that their economy is going well, but I think there are real cracks. And if you look at the structure of the of the Indian nation, I mean, the poverty levels, uh, yeah. basic education, it's improved somewhat, but it, it is not at the level. It is far from being able to really build up a basis to really to launch into a major development program, not only education, but also infrastructure. Yeah. And, and that, that's what I, I don't yeah. see. I don't see uh, by playing off with China and uh, you know, this yeah. border issue is still there. They talk about it all the time. I, 
I appear on Indian TV quite regularly. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is they haven't been talking much about that. Uh, they've been more interested in the situation between uh, China and the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, watching it, who's going to do what. But you know, India at some point has to take responsibility for itself and figure out its own path. Its, its democracy is not a democracy It has in the to US. count on itself yeah, rather but, than play the games that I they're know, playing. But if you yeah, want investment, right. where can you get investment? China would be the logical one. Yeah. If, if Europe and America were going to invest, it would have already happened. And it just hasn't made a big difference. No. Okay, so a couple of things. G20 could not agree um, on what the U.S. wanted to, and Europe wanted to put in about the uh, Russian um, conflict. Mm -hmm. They wanted to use the word invasion mm -hmm. and war, and that was not acceptable. Uh, things. I mean, this is the G20. We're not talking about the UN. Mm -hmm. And it's quite clear that there are some deep divisions if they can't, if the US can't push through uh, its narrative on this. But there are two aspects to this. One is, of course, the world has changed. The global south has changed, right? Yeah. Second is, I have to say, as you said, we have to give a big hurrah to the Indonesians for yeah. managing this because it's not easy to host this particular G20, given the geopolitics that's going on. So the president of Indonesia has done a remarkable job in being able to divert the attention from what the U.S. was pushing for. It's, well, it's, it, these things, the G20 is no longer a uh, simple uh, you know, rubber stamp for what Europe and uh, America wants. That's right. But even within Europe, there was... Some support, uh, they, were, they weren't pushing hard yeah. for this. It was very interesting. Do you, do you really, what, you know, what did you make of the, you know, it was a 30 minute meeting between Albanese and Xi. And it seemed like a lot of talk. It was, you know, the, the Australian businessmen were like, oh, this is the beginning of a reset. What was your read on that? I think it's difficult because the Anglo-Saxon tradition of Australia I remember doing a program on Australian Broadcasting Corporate ABC about uh, three or four years ago. They're talking about the alliance between Australia and the United States runs yeah. very, very deep. Yeah. Uh, you look at... Well, the, the British office. abandoned them during World War II and they, they saw the U.S. as somebody That's who, right. who came who in and helped them. Really protect them. But this is really Cold War era mentality. I think uh, uh, at that time... I talked already about how U.S. is going to take your market share <laughs> in terms of your exports. But I think uh, Australia has entered into a period of recession already. The economy is really not doing well. It has inflationary problems as well. I think, I think the politicians who are either in power or who are out, out, out of power are thinking more now about how to appease the population yeah. at a time when they haven't been able to manage the economy well. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's moved from, you know, China is the great enemy and they're trying to interfere in our politics and we have to uh, get rid of Huawei. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, Albanese didn't apologize for this, well, for his country, not him, mm -hmm. uh, going forward with this idea that China had secretly created the virus and spread it around the world. That's right. And, you know, demanding an investigation. You know, I, I just don't see a lot of movement. I think it's great. They talked, um, but I think it's going to be a slightly longer road. Neither side indicated that they were willing to do anything large. I think some small steps will come out of it, but nothing there are nothing's some, changed. There are 30 some, minutes to change. Yeah. There are some other, other very significant things. I think uh, they're also beginning to feel pressured on the economic, on the trade side with China, because I remember the days when Broken Hill Properties, BHP and the others, basically set the price for global iron ore, yeah. right? They dominated the market and they set the price and the Chinese were paying an exorbitant price for iron ore from Australia. But increasingly, the Chinese have learned the rules of the game and they know how to play it too. So they're increasingly being able to 
not dictate, but influence price setting in the well, commodities when, market. As they say, the customer is always right. That's right. And at a certain point, you know, uh, these consortiums and monopolies, they don't last. That's right. I mean, ironically, it's the West that says, oh, monopolies are bad and all yeah. this kind of stuff. But how many monopolies do we see in the West? I mean, That's every right. major industry in the United mm -hmm. States is dominated by two or three uh, large players. Or globally, the seven sisters in terms of oil. You yeah. Know, it's, and also the other part is the other countries are coming up. African countries, Brazil, in terms of iron ore. Sure. Ah, oh, you, you don't want to sell to China? That's okay, we will. Oh you know? gosh, I remember our, our uh, you know, we had a friend in Brazil who yes. said, oh, Australia? Yes, you shouldn't buy beef from them or the United States. We'll supply it. That's right. Beef, we have beef. Yes. Iron ore, we have yeah, iron, iron ore. ore. Yes. Wheat, we have, we have wheat. wheat. Yes. Soybeans, Soy we have, we have soybeans. Soy beans. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you need, we're here. That's right. I, you know, but I mean, it, it just exposes these things. I, I think it's going to be exacerbated by this economic downturn. Yeah. People are becoming much more pragmatic. Mm -hmm. and